Topic 9, Control Systems, 9.1, Chemical Control in Mammals and Plants. In Topic 4, we learned the importance of water moving either into or out of cells by osmosis in both animal and plant cells. And we know the importance in animal cells because we don't want the animal cells to either lice or shrivel. So it's really important to control the concentration of water in uh, animals, organisms, and this involves homeostasis. So homeostasis is when you maintain a state of dynamic equilibrium through body responses to external and internal stimuli. So in this case, it could be either having too much water or too less water in organisms, and that obviously affects the cells. In terms of the importance for maintaining body, water is not the only thing. pH and temperature are also important. pH and temperature are important because they affect enzymes. So maintaining an optimum enzyme pH and temperature is important so that enzymes are at their highest enzyme activity. And pH and temperature also affect cell membrane structure because they include proteins. Water potential is important to maintain in body is to avoid osmotic effects that damage cells, as mentioned earlier. Now, the nervous and endocrine systems maintain dynamic equilibrium. Changes in body are detected by receptors, which send messages to effectors, which are muscles or glands. And then these muscles or glands could either reverse the change or increase it using feedback systems. There are two types of feedback systems negative and positive. In a negative feedback system, the change in conditions from a narrow range is detected by the sensory receptors and this stimulates effectors to restore equilibrium. In other words, if something increases above the normal homeostatic level, you decrease it back down. And then the reverse could also happen if it decreases below the normal homeostatic level, you then increase it back up. Another type of feedback is positive feedback system, and here the effectors increase the effect triggered by the response. So here, when something increases above the normal homeostatic level, you increase it furthermore. Explain the principles of mammalian hormone production. So you should know this from GCSE. Hormones are chemical messengers. We should know that they're proteins, or they could be peptides, which are shorter than polypeptides roughly less than 20 amino acids in length. But hormones can also be steroids, and these are obviously made of lipids. And they can be secreted by the endocrine gland, and they're clearly transported by the blood to the target organs, where they make the changes. And here's an example of a hormone, adrenaline, which we learned in GCSE. And we know adrenaline is secreted by the adrenal gland, which is an endocrine gland. When it secretes it, it then travels through the blood to its target organ, which could be the heart, blood vessels or liver. In the case of the heart, it makes the heart muscle cells contract more rapidly and more strongly. And therefore, blood flow increases, so does blood pressure, and therefore more blood reaches the muscle cells. And that means that the muscle cells will have access to more glucose. We also learned in Jesus see other hormones such as TRH, TSH, FSH, LH, ADH, so lots of other hormones and where they're secreted by, so in other words, where they're produced and released. So all of these places where hormones are produced are called endocrine glands, such as the hypothalamus or the pituitary, thyroid gland, pancreas, adrenal gland, testes and ovaries. And then the hormones are secreted, then clearly travel through the bloodstream to the target organs where they have an effect. And so these are the ones that we learned in GCC. And here's another example. So this is all about a hormone called ADH. Again, we learned from GCC, which we'll continue understanding in A-level. So here, there's a normal blood concentration. But after drinking water, the blood concentration becomes dilute. There's a high water potential or hypotonic. That's detected by sensory receptors in the hypothalamus. So therefore, less ADH is secreted by the pituitary gland. The collecting duct is less permeable and less water is reabsorbed by osmosis back into the bloodstream 
Therefore, because you drank water, more of that water goes into the urine, making the urine more dilute, and so you have a larger volume of it. And therefore, there's going to be less water now in the blood. The blood concentration goes back to normal. So that's a way of maintaining homeostasis, and you have the reverse. So this is something we learned in GCC. I'll discuss it again um, when we learn about the system. In topic four, we explained how properties of molecules affect how they are transported, specifically in terms of solubility. So if it's something that is lipid soluble, then they use simple diffusion through the phospholipid bilayer, and that's because the molecules could either be nonpolar lipid soluble, such as oxygen carbon dioxide, so they're hydrophobic, so they can enter via this phospholipid bilayer. However, if you're not lipid soluble, in other words, your water soluble, then you have to enter through either the channel protein or the carry protein, and this is known as facilitate diffusion. Describe the two main modes of action in hormones. So lipid insoluble hormones, they can't clearly pass through the cell membranes. An example of that is adrenaline. However, the lipid soluble hormones, so this would be the steroid example, they can pass through the cell membranes. An example of this is estrogen. So how does this work? In terms of adrenaline, what would happen is the hormone, so adrenaline would be the first messenger or any other type of lipid insoluble hormone, they bind to specific receptors. And when they bind to those receptors on the cell surface membrane, this causes adenylate cyclase to be activated. And it then catalyzes the conversion of ATP to something known as CAMP, which is the secondary messenger. And that second messenger can then activate specific enzymes in the cell, which then has an effect on the cell and changes it in terms of its function. In case of adrenaline, you can clearly tell the liver to break down glycogen into glucose. Whereas lipid soluble hormones such as estrogen the hormone binds to receptors inside the cell. So the hormone receptor complex then forms and that passes through the nuclear membrane pores into the nucleus. And this hormone receptor complex then acts as a transcription factor, which regulates the gene expression of proteins, which we learned in a previous topic. So this was in topic seven. And that modifies the cell activity. So these are two different examples of how hormones work. If they're lipid insoluble, such as adrenaline, the hormone will act as a first messenger, and the second messenger is formed, known as CAMP, because adenylate cyclase get activated and catalyze the conversion of ATP. And that causes cell activity to be modified. Whereas in the case of estrogen, other lipid soluble hormones, the hormone can bind to receptors inside the cell and the hormone receptor complex then acts as a transcription factor, which regulates gene expression. In GCC, we learned about shoots and how they can grow towards light. And the first two experiments you can see here on the left, you can see they're growing towards the light. But on the third experiment, the one that is closest to the light, you could see that the shoot is just growing straight. And that's because it is capped. So if it's capped, that means that there are chemicals there that are not responding because they're not receiving light. So therefore, light could be a stimulus towards plant growing. And when the plants grow, we know that it contains a hormone called auxins on the tip of the shoot. So in GCC, we learned about these three hormones, auxins, gibberellins, and ephines. We don't necessarily need to know their functions from what we learned in GCC, but we learn slightly different functions in A-level. So just a reminder, how do plants grow? We know that cell division takes place in regions of plants called the meristems, and these tissues found on the tips of shoots and roots. And where the meristems are, that's where the zone of cell division happens. In other words, that's where mitosis occurs. And then these cells, when they are produced, clearly they start to then elongate. And they elongate due to the response of auxins, that means the cells get longer, and then afterwards they start to differentiate. That's known as a zone of cell differentiation, so they become specialized for different functions.
So we learned obviously in GCC that the auxins are found on the tip of the shoot and when they diffuse due to responsive light, they diffuse more towards the shaded side and that means that that side, the cells will elongate more. So it's the auxins that are causing the cells to elongate. The state explained the effects of plant growth substance auxin as a chemical controls in plants. So we know auxin causes cell elongation, but we're also going to learn now how it's involved in the suppression of lateral buds for apical dominance. So what effect does auxin have in terms of cell elongation? Well, it means that the cell walls can stretch more. So the more auxins there are in a cell, the more the cell walls can stretch, and this causes the cells to elongate. So auxins are plant growth substances, the hormones that are produced on the tips of shoots. They respond to light by diffusing unequally more towards the shaded side. This causes cell angulation more on the shaded side. And that means the plant shoot bends and grows towards light so plants can do more photosynthesis. Explain that plant growth substances often interact with each other. So here we're talking about two hormones and this is all about the suppression of lateral buds for apical dominance in terms of auxin, what effect it has, and then the other hormone that is also involved, which is called cytokinin. So auxin and cytokinin work antagonistically on the maintenance of the apical dominance. This is all about the apical bud, which you can see in the picture. The balance between both growth regulators determines response of plants and provides very fine control of a response. So the apical bud grows bigger and faster than the, all the other buds, which are the lateral buds. And that's because the high oxygen levels produced by the apical bud inhibits the growth of the lateral buds. However, as the apical bud grows away, that effect of the oxygen, the inhibition effect, is reduced. And the cytokinin then becomes the dominant um, hormone and it activates growth of the lateral buds lower down. So here we've got two hormones, oxygen and cytokinin, working antagonistically. The oxygen's effect is mainly on the apical blood and what it does is it then inhibits the growth of the lateral buds. However, as it grows away, it has less an effect on those lateral buds and therefore cytokinin has more of an effect and cytokinin then becomes dominant and causes those lateral buds to, that are lower down to start growing. An example of how this is used in real life scenario is pruning, where you actually remove the active apical bud that contains auxins. And when you remove them, that means that they don't have any more effect on the lateral buds. So cytokinin therefore causes the lateral buds to start to grow. And this makes the plants more bushier. And a very good example of this would be Christmas trees, where you have more uh, bushier Christmas trees due to the fact that there are more lateral buds that are grown. And that occurs because you're removing the apical bud, so you're removing the effect of auxins. Again, obviously, we learned about different experiments that were done by scientists such as Mendel on uh, plant shoots. So if we look at the results of these experiments that we saw in GCC, you can see in A that the auxins diffuse unequally more towards the shaded side, causing them to elongate more. That means the cell walls can stretch, and that means the shoot bends and grows towards the light. Whereas in B, by putting a cap on top of the on the tip, that means auxins aren't stimulated by light, so they will just diffuse down equally due to gravity, and therefore the cells on both sides will elongate and the shoot will just grow straight but not towards the light. Whereas in C, you've got a transparent cap, so auxins are responding towards the light and they are diffusing more towards the shaded side, just like A, and they have the same response. In D, removing the tip means you remove auxins, therefore, there's no auxins to diffuse down, so cells can't elongate, so there's no growth. In E, removing the tip and then placing something impermeable in between by putting the tip back on top of it means that the auxins can't diffuse the impermeable block and so therefore the cells below don't receive any auxins and there's no cell elongation so again no growth and f this time you are removing the tip by you putting something permeable in between which is an agar block so when you put the tip back on the auxins do diffuse through the agar block 
and that means you have similar response to A, where the cells uh, on the shaded side will see more auxins, and therefore they will elongate more, and they will bend and grow towards the light. In topic two, we learned about the importance of the endosperm and how that provides nutrients for germination because it's a store of starch. And then the endosperm comes from the triplet endosperm nucleus, where a male genitum nucleus fused with the two polar nuclei. In core practical 14, we investigate the effect of gibberlin on the production of amylase in germinating cereals using a starch agar assay. So how do seeds germinate in the first place? Well, first the seeds will absorb water and swell, and that activates the embryo. When that happens, the embryo secretes gibberlin. So these are natural gibberlin in seeds, and that diffuses to the alluring layer. And when it does that, the gibberlin stimulates the alluring layer to produce amylase. And the enzyme amylase digests starch, which is in the endosperm, and that diffuses into the endosperm and breaks down the starch to provide food to the embryo. And the embryo can then use that material for respiration and growth, which means that the seed can therefore start to germinate. So a practical can be done to look at the effect of gibberlin on the production of amylase. So you can see here that clearly when the embryo secretes gibberlin, it diffuses to the alluring layer and that stimulates the production of amylase. So if we were to do an experiment on a starch agar, so an agar that contains starch on it, what we could do is we could cut our seeds and we could separate the embryo side with the side that contains the alluring layer, which is obviously the part that is used to produce the amylase. We use sterile starch agar plates in the first place to make sure that there's no effect of any other microbes. We could add gibberlin to the starch solution, which will then form part of the starch agar plates. We cut the seeds in agar for 24 hours. We leave it there to see what effects they have. We could test the sample with iodine solution, because clearly if there's still starch there, then we know that the amylase wasn't having any effect, or there's no amylase. But if there's less starch, which we could see from the circle layer, we could therefore see that starch is broken down. We can me measure the area of the clear zone. And if there is a clear zone, then clearly the amylase broke down the starch of the agar plates. So looking at these results, you can see that only agar plate 2, which contains gibberlin in the agar, plus the aryan layer and the seed, displayed clear areas, so there's no starch present around the seeds. And the evaluation of that is that in agar plate 2, the gibberlin in the agar stimulated the aluron layer to produce amylase, and that digested the starch in agar. Explain how phytochrome controls photomorphogenesis. So photomorphogenesis is a process in which plants development is controlled by levels and type of light. So day night length, which is known as photoperiod, is an environmental stimulus that determines changes. So it's things like the bud development or fruit ripening or flowering and leaf fall. Now there is a blue-green pigment called phytochrome which is found on the shoots and leaves of plant, and there are two different forms of it. You've got phytochrome red, which absorbs red light, and then phytochrome far red, which absorbs far red light. And during the day, the phytochrome red version of the phytochrome converts into the phytochrome far red. And then overnight, when there's a lack of light, it slowly converts back into phytochrome red. Now long day plants, they flowers in relatively long days and short nights, and this is due to high levels of stimulatory phytochrome far red from long periods of light. 
How about if a short day plants? They flowers when days are short and nights are long. And this is due to lack of inhibitory phytochrome far red from long period of darkness. Some plants are day neutral, so they're not affected by photopyrism and they're located clearly in tropical regions where there's a constant length of the day all year round. Explain how red and far red light affects flowering and germination. So red light stimulates flowering or germination by converting phytochrome red to phytochrome far red. The far red light inhibits flowering or germination by converting phytochrome far red to phytochrome red. The last wavelength received determines the form of phytochrome present. So phytochrome far red is the active phytochrome and genes involved in flowering or germination are then switched on if they are present. The enzymes involved in flowering and germination are then synthesized and therefore flowering and germination then occur. So as long as phytochrome far red is present because it's the active form, that's the one that's going to then cause the activation of these genes and then activation of enzymes involved in flowering germination. But for that phytochrome far red to be available, the red light has to stimulate the conversion of phytochrome red to phytochrome far red. However, the phytochrome far red turns back to phytochrome red slowly during uh, nighttime when there's a lack of light. So having short periods or having extremely long periods of daylight and really short periods of night means that the phytochrome far red, there'll be more of them and therefore they can activate um, the gene expression of, for flowering and germination. 9.2, the mammalian nervous system. Describing the mammalian nervous system, we know it's composed of the central nervous system, the CNS, which is the brain and spinal cord, but then it also involves the peripheral nervous system, which is the neurons. And we learned in GCC there are three types of neurons. So we've got the sensory neurons. And you can see in the sensory neurons, we've got the different parts that we learned also in GCC. So we've got the dendrites, which is linked to the sensory receptors. And they can detect things like changes in pressure or temperature or pain or light. And then electrical impulses are transmitted from the dendrites to the dendron, past the cell body, which contains the nucleus, into the axon, and then to the axon terminal. We've also got relay neurons, and these are located in the CNS, the brain and spinal cords. And these relay neurons, you can see in terms of its structure, they don't have myelin sheets. So they don't have that fatty layer that protects and keeps the energy so that electrical impulses can be transmitted very fast. And the last neuron is a motor neuron. And in motor neurons, there are no dendrons. So the cell body is just linked to an axon. Again, there are myelin sheets. And in between the myelin sheets, there are gaps there, and these gaps are known as the nodes of Ranvier, which we'll discuss later on. The motor neurons transmit electrical impulses to effectors, which we learned earlier can be muscles or glands, which then cause the effect or the changes that need to happen to the response to the stimulus. So here, if we look in the motor neuron structure in more detail, we can see it's got dendrites on the cell body. Then it's got the axons, which are covered by the myelin sheets with gaps in between, known as the nodes of Ranvia. The myelin sheets are made of a fatty layer of swan cells, and they're connected to effectors that I mentioned. And you can see a diagram at the bottom of how an electrical impulse can be transmitted across an axon. So in topic four, we learned about the structure of the phospholipid. And we also learned about that in topic two and topic one. 
So we have an understanding of the fact that there are phospholipids in the bile layer. There are also proteins that are also involved. They could be channel proteins or they could be carrier proteins. So here's an example of a carrier protein. And here we can see that three sodium ions first bind to the carrier protein. And then using a phosphate from the hydrolysis of ATP, you also you have a change in the shape of the carrier protein. And sodium ions also move across the membrane on the opposite direction inside the cell. And this clearly because we've got a change in protein and we're using uh, the energy from ATP hydrolysis. This is a carry protein, so it's an active process that requires energy. Describe the structure of cell surface membrane of an axon of a neuron. So just like any cell surface membrane, we can see that there's a phospholipid bilayer. In this case, there are sodium potassium pumps, as mentioned on the previous slide. There are also channel proteins, so in this case, voltage gated sodium ion channel proteins, and these ones open based on the voltage, and there are also voltage gated potassium ion channels. Explain how resin potential is maintained in a neuron. Now, when a neuron has an electrical impulse that is transmitted across it, an action potential occurs, but when there is no electrical impulse transmitted, is at a resting potential. So that local region of the membrane has a resting potential of minus 70 millivolts. So how is the resting potential maintained? There is a sodium potassium pump. And as I mentioned earlier, three sodium ions are pumped out of the neuron and two potassium ions are pumped in. Now we know but both sodium ions and potassium ions have a positive charge. So sodium ions are moved out and potassium ions are moved in. But because three are moved out and two are moved in, clearly you're moving more positive ions out of the um, axon. So therefore the outside of the axon is going to become more positive. The other thing is the potassium ions that are moved in, they are then moved out again through the potassium ion channels. However, the sodium ion channels are closed. That's because their membrane is impermeable to the sodium ions. So therefore the sodium ions clearly can't move back in. The effect of all of this is that the outside of the axon is more positive than the inside. And because the outside is more positive than inside, it creates a potential difference of minus 70 inside and that minus 70 millivolts is known as the resting potential and that occurs when there's no electrical impulses that are being transmitted. Now what is an electrical impulse? So when there's a nerve impulse is actually an action potential that's being propagated across the axon. So an action potential happens in a small localized region and then it happens in the region next to it and it happens in the adjacent region next to it and then the next adjacent region and it keeps um, following on. So it keeps propagating across the axon. So an action potential is propagated and that action potential has different stages. So when there's no electrical impulse is known as a resting potential of minus 70 millivolts, which we mentioned, but then it reaches a potential difference of minus 50 millivolts that reaches the threshold and when the threshold potential is reached we then have depolarization and then we have repolarization back to the resting potential and this whole cycle is an action potential and that happens in a localized region and then it continues happening on the next adjacent region until it propagates across the whole axon and that is electrical impulse that is actually being transmitted across the axon explain how an action potential is formed So as I mentioned just before, a nerve impulses are actually action potentials that are propagated along the axons of a neuron. We know that the resting potential is minus 70 millivolts as is relatively negative inside compared to the outside explained before. This is because there's a sodium potassium pump that maintains the resting potential. So there are more sodium ions outside than inside. 
And then when action potential is stimulated, depolarization along the action happens. And this is because a threshold potential is first reached. And when the threshold potential is reached, so the threshold potential is minus 50 millivolts, the sodium ion channels then open. So remember, these are the voltage gated ones, and sodium ions then diffuse in. And this causes depolarization. So the inside of the axon now becomes more positive charge than the outside. And that is roughly slightly above 35 millivolts. The potassium ion channels, the voltage gated ones, now open and potassium ions diffuse out. And this causes repolarization. So when that happens, we go back to the resting potential. Now that happens in a localized area of the axon, so we call that a local current. But then the next localized area, the adjacent side, the sodium ions that were inside the axon will then diffuse between the depolarized region to the next adjacent region of the axon. And that means that region now becomes depolarized and a threshold potential is reached. So when the adjacent area becomes depolarized or the threshold potential is reached and depolarization happens, the whole of the action potential happens again. And that then keeps happening to the next adjacent localized area until you keep having these action potentials propagated across the axon. So you can see in this example here, you have an action potential at the beginning of the axon, and then that then propagates to the next localized area. So you have the next local current area, and then the next adjacent one to the next one, and you keep having these action potentials happen due to the sodium ions diffusing from the depolarized region to the next adjacent region. So a threshold potential is reached, and then depolarization and repolarization occurs and it keeps happening to the next localized area until the action potential is propagated across the whole axon. So in this example, we can see that in the top motor neuron, you can see that the electrical impulse is transmitted much faster than the bottom example. And you clearly see that's because it has myelin sheets. The action potential propagation myelin neurons is actually much faster than in ones that are unmyelinated. So why is that? That's because in the unmyelinated ones, you can see that you got to have lots of small localized regions of action potential one after the other in adjacent areas. So they have to have lots and lots of action potential next to each other. Whereas in the myelinated region, you could have the sodium ions diffusing from the depolarized region to the next adjacent region through a longer length. And that means you don't need to have lots and lots of action potentials one after the other. You could have longer regions between the action potentials. So when it propagates along the axon, you don't need to do huge amounts of action potentials because in between the myelin sheets, you've got the nodes of Rambia, and that is the region where the sodium ion channels can then open and so having a longer region where there's no action potential means that it gets transmitted much faster across the axon. So the propagation of the action potential is much faster. Explain why speed of transmission along myelinated axons is greater than along non-myelinated axons. So myelination increases the propagation speed of action potentials a long axonal neuron, and this is because it allows something called sultry conduction. And sultry conduction is the jumping of the nerve impulses between the nodes of Rambia. Explain why nerve impulse speed along axons is slower in people with multiple sclerosis, because they've got a loss of myelin around the motor neurons. This is because sultry conduction doesn't occur because there are fewer nodes of Ramvia, so impulse doesn't jump between the nodes, and sodium ion channels have to stimulate local current flow along each section of the membrane. So depolarization has to therefore occur along the whole length, 
as an alternative to when there are myelination where you have depolarization that's occurring through longer lengths. So you can see in this animation again that having myelination means that you could have solitary conduction occurring because there is a longer length before the next node of Ranvia, whereas in the unmyelinated region, on the bottom example, you can see that there has to be lots of depolarization and action potentials in adjacent regions that are shorter in terms of length, so therefore the transmission takes more time. In GCC, we learned that there are gaps between neurons, and these gaps are known as synapses. So when an electrical nerve impulse reaches the end of a neuron, it triggers the release of neurotransmitters. These neurotransmitters then diffuse across the synapse and they bind to the next neuron and that then generates a new electrical impulse on the next neuron, which then transmits across. So here we can see an animation of what actually happens and the additional parts we have to learn in A-levels. So you can see that calcium ion channels are also involved. We also know that there are sodium gates that have to be opened due to the binding of the neurotransmitters to receptors on the next neuron. And this is the postsynaptic membrane. And when the threshold is then reached, we have a new electrical impulse. To explain the structure and function of synapse, including the role of the transmitter substances acetylcholine and noradrenaline. So first, an action potential or an impulse arrives at the presynaptic knob. And when it does that, the calcium ion channels open and calcium ions diffuse in. The synaptic vesicles move towards and fuses with the presynaptic membrane. And when it does that, the neurotransmitters are then released by exocytosis and diffuse across the synaptic cleft. And when they do that, they then bind to neurotransmitter receptors on the postsynaptic membrane. And that could do two things. So you can either open sodium ion channels so that sodium ions diffuse in to the postsynaptic neuron. When it does that, if there is a sufficient excitatory postsynaptic potential, the positive charge of the sodium ions in the postsynaptic cell then exceeds the threshold level, an action potential then occurs that will then travel along the postsynaptic neuron. However, if it's a neurotransmitter that binds to neurotransmitter receptors on the postsynaptic membrane that opens the negative ion channels, that will then allow negative ions to enter. So the inside of the postsynaptic neuron becomes more negative than normal. And that means that it's harder to, than more normal than the resting potential. And this results in an inhibitory postsynaptic potential. So therefore action potentials are less likely to occur in the postsynaptic neuron or fiber. So neurotransmitters then become hydrolyzed by enzymes in the future, so they don't constantly stay bind to the neurotransmitter receptors. And those neurotransmitters are then reabsorbed back into the presynaptic knob and the vesicle forms around them so they can be used again in the future. Now the postsynaptic neuron is connected with lots of presynaptic neurons. So the effect of the neurotransmitters is based on the collection of the effect of all of those presynaptic neurons. So clearly you could have an excitatory and inhibitory postsynaptic potential that cancel each other out. You could have a spatial summation where you have lots of neurons, the presynaptic neurons, um, have cause an excitatory postsynaptic potential on the postsynaptic neuron and together the spatial summation of them causes the postsynaptic neuron then to reach a threshold and therefore an action potential then is stimulated.
or you could have one neuron, one presynaptic neuron causing a temporal summation. So it has lots of signals that are an additional to each other. So many excitatory potentials from one neuron triggers a threshold point. So the important one to understand here for A-level is the spatial summation, because we're going to have to understand that later on, where you have more than one presynaptic neuron, where both of them together cause excitatory potentials mm -hmm. to the postsynaptic neuron, and then the spatial summation of them could trigger a threshold point in the postsynaptic neuron for an action potential to be stimulated. You can see this animation here where the electrical impulse reaches the end of the presynaptic membrane and calcium ion channels open, calcium ions diffuse in, and then the neurotransmitter vesicles move and fuse with the presynaptic membrane, triggering the neurotransmitters to diffuse across the synapse, bind to the neurotransmitter receptors, and that means either sodium ion channels are open for sodium ions to move in, so there's a higher chance of reaching a threshold, or the negative ion channels are open with negative ions diffusing in, and therefore there's less likely chance of action potential occurring. And then don't forget at the end, the neurotransmitters don't stay bind to these neurotransmitter receptors. They are then uh, broken down by enzymes, and then those neurotransmitters diffuse back into the presynaptic um, neuron where they can be reused again. Explain how effects of drugs can be caused by influence on synaptic transmission. So obviously there are lots of different phases of the synaptic transmission and all of these different phases or parts can be targeted by drugs, whether they're targeted to increase the chance of a threshold occurring in the postsynaptic neuron or decreasing the chances depends on what type of drug is used. And the three that in A level that are focused on are lidocaine, cobra venom and nicotine. In lidocaine, the, it blocks the voltage-gated sodium ion channels and because it blocks them, therefore it prevents the generation of action potential because the postsynaptic membrane can't be depolarized. Cobra venom has a similar effect on the synaptic transmission. In this case, cobra venom blocks acetylcholine receptors. So if you block them, the acetylcholine can't bind to these acetylcholine receptors. So therefore, you can't then generate an action potential on the postsynaptic membrane. Whereas nicotine mimics the effect of acetylcholine. So when it mimics that effect, it acts like it's the acetylcholine when it binds to the acetylcholine receptors and that generates an action potential on the postsynaptic neuron. And so a nerve impulse then occurs. So those are the three different drugs we're going to look at the effect, but there are other effects of drugs that you need to understand. So anything to do with mimicking the neurotransmitter or causing new more neurotransmitters to be released all of those effects can, or even preventing the degradation of neurotransmitters by the enzymes. So that means the neurotransmitters still stay binded to the neurotransmitter receptors on the postsynaptic membrane causes an effect of the drug for an action potential to be generated in the postsynaptic neuron. And then obviously you could have the opposite effect, anything that causes less neurotransmitters to be released or blocks the neurotransmitter receptors or causes um, more enzyme breakdown of the neurotransmitters clearly will then therefore causes a prevention of an action potential in the postsynaptic membrane so it can't be depolarized so less chance of an action potential occurring. In GSSC we learned about the different parts of the eye and we should obviously know the part of the eye that detects and responds to the light. So obviously light first goes through the cornea where it's refracted, goes through the pupil, and then the change in the shape of the lens causes fine tuning of refraction. So the light rays can then focus on the retina. So the retina is the part that detects and responds to the light. 
And if you look at the retina, we know that there are two light sensitive cells. So these are photoreceptor cells. And they're called buds and cones. We describe the role of rod cells in initiating action potentials to the brain. The rod cells actually contain a visual pigment called rhodopsin. And rhodopsin is actually made of cis isomer retinol and opsin. And the cis retinol and opsin are bound together, but when a photon of lime hits it, that rhodopsin gets bleached because the retinol turns from a cis version, so cis retinol turns into trans retinol. And that trans retinol doesn't stay bound to opsin, so they separate, and that's known as rhodopsin bleaching. And when the rhodopsin is bleached, the effect it has is the sodium ion channels of the rod cells close, and sodium ions can't therefore diffuse into the rod cells. However, there's still sodium potassium pump that is moving the sodium ions out of the rod cells, and because of that, the insides of the cell becomes more negative than the resin potential, and this is known as hyperpolarization. So that mm -hmm. generator potential that is produced means that the inhibitory neurotransmitter glutamate from the rod cells is stopped from being released. So if you stop releasing the neurotransmitter glutamate, which is an inhibitory neurotransmitter, therefore it causes depolarization or an action potential then to occur in the bipolar cell because you're actually not releasing any more of the inhibitory neurotransmitter. Now that bipolar cell is then linked to a ganglion cell and both of them are examples of sensory neurons so therefore an action potential can occur in both and then that obviously then occurs through the optic nerve that then transmits an electrical impulse to the brain. That, um, that a light stimulus has been detected. Explain role of mitochondria in functioning of rod cells. So we know in mitochondria they release energy or they make ATP and that is mainly used for the sodium potassium pump or the active transport ions and the ATP is also used in the dark because it helps to regenerate Rhodopsin. So in other words, it combines opsin and retinol together. It helps to convert the trans retinol into cis retinol. So using that example, clearly the opposite, therefore, of what we just explained happens in the dark. So in the dark, the opsin and the retinol uh, combine together. And therefore, sodium ion channels are now going to be open. And if they're open, that means that inside of the cell, becomes more or less negative and when it becomes less negative a threshold would therefore be reached and when the threshold potential is reached the inhibiting neurotransmitter glutamate can be released and when it does that it clearly then means that there's not going to be any depolarization or action potential in the bipolar cell and then in the ganglion cells so these sensory neurons are not going to be stimulated so there's no electrical impulses sent to the brain and clearly that's because there are no photons of light detected, so that happens during the dark. Now when we look at this animation here, on the top we could see that most of the cone cells are located in the centre. And you can see there are three different types of cone cells. So we've got ones that detect red light, or blue light or green light, and a combination of them can then form the different colours based on the wavelengths. And the rod cells are more distributed on the outside, the periphery. Looking at animation at the bottom, when the light enters the eye and is detected by the retina, they stimulate the rods and cone cells in the retina. But the impulse that travels through the bipolar cell and the ganglion cells is in the opposite direction of the way the light enters. Now we learn to Jesus see that the eye is a sense organ that contains those two photoreceptor cells in the retina called rods and cones and we know that the cones receptor cells are the ones that are sensitive to color so they could obviously detect red light or green light or blue light 
and that electrical impulse is then generated into sensory neurons in the bipolar cell and the ganglion cell. The electrical impulse is then transmitted through the optical nerve and that information from all of these cones is then processed in the brain. The rod receptor cells detect a difference in light intensity instead of colour. So they can work in very dim light, whereas cones can only work in bright light. So that's why the colour vision is really poor in dim light. If you go to a room that's really dark, seeing colour is very, very difficult, but seeing the difference in light intensity is much easier. So rod receptor cells, those photoreceptor cells work much better when there is very dim light, but cone receptor cells, those photoreceptor cells don't work very well in dim light. So describe the structure of the human retina. So as we mentioned earlier, the nerve impulses are transmitted to the brain and they're transmitted from these photoreceptors. So these light sensitive rod and cone cells that detect the stimulus, so they detect the change in color or they take the change in light intensity. Then we have impulses that are sent to or transmitted to the bipolar cell. After the bipolar cell is the ganglion cell and then obviously it reaches the optic nerve. Now those two photoreceptor cells, the rods and cone cells, they're the sensory receptors. Electrical impulses are clearly transmitted through the sensory neurons, which are the bipolar and ganglion cells, until they reach the optic nerve, which then transmits it to the brain for it to be processed. As I mentioned earlier in the animation, if the light passes through the sensory neurons before reaching the rods and cone cells, so explain why myelinated neurons in the retina will not form clear images. And that's because the myelination can absorb or reflect the light. So that means less light is passed to these light sensitive cells, the rods and cone photoreceptor cells. So these rod light sensitive cells will not become stimulated or bleached. Explain how distribution of human rod and cone cells maintain vision in different light intensities. So we go think about the both types of photoreceptor cells and where they're located. The rod cells are located in the periphery, whereas cones are located in the fovea, which we mentioned where it has a huge concentration of these cone cells. Rod cells detect light intensity, whereas cone cells detect a change in color. In rod cells, the visual pigment is rhodopsin, but in cone cells is a different visual pigment called iodopsin. Rod cells have a high sensitivity in low light intensities. However, they have a low level of clear detail in the image that is detected. And that's because there are three rod cells connected to one bipolar cell. Because there are three rod cells connected to one bipolar cell, the brain, when it tries to process it, can't tell which of these rod cells received the light, so therefore the level of detail is not going to be very clear in the image. However, for cone cells, they are, have low sensitivity in low light intensities, and the reason for that is that iodepsin needs to be hit with more light energy than rhodopsin to break down. However, they have a higher level of clear detail in the scene image, and that's because one cone cell is linked to one bipolar sensory neuron. So because there's one they're linked to another, the brain can then think about which of the cone cells, whether it's the one that detects red light, red wavelength, or blue wavelength, or green wavelength, which color it is, and therefore you process it much better. So there's a higher level of clear detail when the brain tries to process that information. However, it has a lower sensitivity and low light intensities because of the fact that more light energy is required to bleach iodopsin compared to rhodopsin in rod receptor cells. So when we come back to the slide, again, we can now see that the distribution of the cone cells are more centrally located, very close to each other. So you've got a high concentration of cone cells in one region of the retina known as the fovea, whereas the rod receptor cells are more located in the periphery. And then with rod receptors, you have usually got three rod receptor cells 
linked to one bipolar cell. So clearly the brain, when it tries to process that information, it doesn't know which rod cell was stimulated. So therefore, detecting a clear image in terms of change in light intensity is very difficult, whereas cone receptor cells, one of these cells are linked to one bipolar cell, and therefore you get a clear image in terms of a change in light, in terms of which cone cells were stimulated. Describe the location and main functions of brain regions. So these are the different parts of the brain we learned in GCC. We've got the cerebrum, the hypothalamus, the pituitary gland, the medulla oblongata, and the cerebellum. In terms of the function, we know the cerebrum is involved in initiating movement. The hypothalamus is involved in thermoregulation and osmoregulation. The medulla oblongata is related to both controlling the breathing and heart rate, whereas the cerebrum is involved with controlling balance and coordination of movement. So we learned from GCC the fine muscle movements involved are linked to the cerebellum. Describe the division of the peripheral nervous system. So this involves the neurons, these nerve fibers, and when we separate them, that peripheral nervous system can be split into two different nervous systems. We've got the voluntary part and the autonomic part. And the voluntary part involves the motor neurons under voluntary or conscious control through the cerebrum. So things like picking up a drink or switching the computer on. So these are things that you do consciously, you tend to think about it. Whereas the autonomic nervous system involves motor neurons that are not controlled by the conscious areas of the brain. So they're controlled by involuntary bodily functions, such as your heart or breathing rate, or sweating, or dilating, or constricting your blood vessels or your pupils, vasoconstriction, vasodilation. So these are things you don't think about. So they involve the autonomic nervous system of the peripheral nervous system. And they could further then be split into two parts. You've got the sympathetic autonomic nervous system, and you've got the parasympathetic autonomic nervous system. The sympathetic autonomic nervous system is where there's a rapid response at the target organ systems. So they do things like speeding up the heart or breathing rate by releasing noradrenaline. However, the parasympathetic autonomic nervous system, they have a, the opposite effect. They have an inhibitory effect on target organ systems. So they are linked to things like slowing down the heart or breathing rate. In this case, they release the neurotransmitter acetylcholine. And both of these parts of the autonomic nervous system, the sympathetic and the parasympathetic autonomic nervous systems, they act antagonistically to each other. So it's like an accelerator or brake of the car. So therefore you have a fine control. So the heart, that means that the heart rate can be controlled where you could increase or decrease the heart rate by one beat per minute. So you have a really fine control how much you wanna change the heart rate because of the electrical impulses that are stimulated through the release of noradrenaline through the sympathetic autonomic system or the release of acetylcholine, the amount of acetylcholine that is released by the parasympathetic autonomic system. So here we can see an animation that explains that where we obviously just talked about the fact the medulla oblongata um, is the one that detects the amount of change that is required and is linked to the heart, the SAN, through the sympathetic autonomic nervous system and the parasympathetic autonomic nervous system. And it could then transmit electrical impulses where through the release of either noradrenaline or acetylcholine causes a fine control change in the heart rate. And obviously they don't just affect the heart rate, they could affect other parts. So in terms of the parasympathetic autonomic nervous system. This generally is involved in the rest and digest or the what was known as the feed and breed responses. So things like constricting the pupil or stimulating salivation, in the, inhibiting the heart rate as we mentioned, or constricting the bokhari, stimulating digestive activity, etc. Whereas the sympathetic autonomic nervous system is more involved with what you would have learned previously is known as the fight or flight responses. So these are things like accelerating the heart rate, increasing the breathing rate, dilating the pupil so that more light enters, things like inhibiting the digestive activity. So the main focus of energy is in muscle movement. So obviously that requires the stimulation 
of releasing uh, glucose by the liver so more glycogen is broken down to release liver uh, glucose by the liver and again they also involve the secretion of epinephrine which is adrenaline and obviously uh, epinephrine and norepinephrine from the kidney adrenaline has similar effect as well in GCC we learnt about the reflex action so we know that if there was a stimulus such as pain it would be detected by receptor cells which will be in the sense organ in this case the skin so pain receptors in the skin will detect the um, flame that's being touched the pain from that and then electrical impulses would therefore be transmitted first through the sensory neuron which transmits electrical nerve impulses from the sensory receptor cells in this case the skin all the way to the sense which is in the sense organ to the relay neurons in the CNS and then the electrical nerve impulse will be transmitted in the relay neuron from the sensory neuron to the motor neuron so it goes from one part of the CNS to another and the motor neuron then transmits electrical impulses from the relay neuron in the CNS to the effector which could be either the muscle or it could be a gland so we learned about endocrine glands these are ones that secrete hormones or there could be other glands as well such as um, things like um, sweat glands so these are more exocrine ones and they're not ones involved with hormone secretion So reflex actions are used as a response that are extremely quick and they protect the body. So the neuron pathway that is involved is called a reflex arc. So describe the structure of the spinal cord. Here we can see how a reflex arc is used. So the sensory receptor, such as the pain receptor cells in the skin, we detected could be any other types of uh, stimulus detected by different receptor cells in our body. And they then form an electrical impulse first through the sensory neurons. And that sensory neuron links through a dorsal root to the CNS. And that dorsal root contains a dorsal root ganglion. And the dorsal root ganglion is the part that contains all the cell bodies of the sensory nerve fibers. Electrical impulse then get transmitted through the relay neuron and then they get transmitted through the motor neuron and the motor neuron are in the ventral root so obviously there are no dendrons so the cell body is in the cns or obviously it could be the spinal cord or the brain and then the axon goes through the ventral root and links all the way to the effector which would be a muscle or a gland in this case the effector is a muscle here and the muscle can then contract so it can do a response and then this links to the structures of the three different types of neurons that we talked about earlier so we've got the sensory neuron which has a dendron and an axon so in between there is a cell body these dendrons tend to be much longer and the cell bodies are located as i mentioned in the dorsal root ganglion in the whole of the sensory neuron goes through the dorsal root to reach the spinal cord. In the spinal cord or the brain, we've got the relay neurons and they're not myelinated. So in this case, it's not important in terms of how quick the message is because they tend to be very, very short neurons. And then you've got the motor neuron, which doesn't have a dendron and they're just axons. So the cell bodies are part of the CNS and then you've got the axon that's going through the ventral root all the way up to the effector which as mentioned could be a muscle or a gland 9.3 homeostasis in topic 4 we learnt about the sequence of events for the cardiac cycle so here obviously the heart doesn't require an external nerve impulse from the brain to contract the heart so this means that it is myogenic so the stimulation generated within the heart and then it acts as a heart pacemaker in terms of specialized cells these are obviously in the SAN so that means the contraction is initiated there that then causes depolarization 
which is a wave of electrical impulse or excitation. So we should know what depolarization actually now means, which causes the atria to contract, known as atrial systole. And then obviously there is a delay at the AVN because we want the atria to contract before the ventricles contract. Then the electrical impulse from the AVN gets transmitted. So we then have depolarization through the bundle of His and the Perkins fibers. This then continues to the apex of the heart where ventricular systole then occurs afterwards. So this is obviously depolarization that causes the contraction of the ventricles. In ECG, we could see the different phases of the sequence of these cardiac cycles. So we know that the P wave shows the depolarization of the atria. The QRS complex shows the depolarization during the ventricular systole. So that's when the ventricles contract. And then obviously when they relax, that's the T waves. So that's where repolarization of the ventricles occurs. So we should be able to link that with repolarization of the action potential when the ventricles relax. In GCSE, we learned a little bit about how acid rain is acidic because the rainwater um, that is acidic is due to a gas that is dissolved in it, and that is obviously carbon dioxide. So therefore, the more carbon dioxide that is dissolved in the rain, the more acidic it is going to be. And therefore we detect that because it's going to be a lower pH. And clearly we have the opposite in acid rain. If there is less carbon dioxide dissolved, it's going to be less acidic and it's going to have a higher pH. So effectively, if a fluid has more carbon dioxide dissolved in it, it's going to be more acidic. And an example of a fluid in our bodies that could have carbon dioxide is clearly our blood plasma. And if our blood plasma has got more carbon dioxide, that's because our cells specifically respiratory cells or ones that do more respiration like uh, muscle cells therefore more carbon dioxide are produced so the blood plasma will have more carbon dioxide dissolved in it which therefore needs to be transported to the lungs to get rid of so if you've got more carbon dioxide that can be detected because clearly the blood plasma is going to be more acidic so it'll have a lower pH so there needs to be a part of our body that could detect or sense that there's a lower pH in the blood and if it does that then it recognizes that more respiration has happened, so therefore we need to increase the heart rate to get that um, carbon dioxide dissolved, transported out much faster to the lungs, and also increase our breathing rate to breathe out that carbon dioxide. Then you have the opposite, you could breathe in car oxygen more quicker, and therefore obviously oxygen could be transported around the body much quicker because the heart rate will be faster as well. It will also be an increase in the heart rate to get rid of the lactic acid or get it to be transported to the liver so it can be broken down faster. And so what controls both the heart rate and the breathing rate? We know that is detected by the medulla oblongata and obviously there are sympathetic autonomic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system that links to the SAN of the heart so they could, they could tell the heart to increase or decrease the heart rate and obviously as I said earlier this is like a accelerator and the brakes so you can have fine tuning of the heart rate so you can change it um, very in very small amounts depending on the need of the body to get rid of carbon dioxide describe how the autonomic nervous system controls the heart rate so when you exercise that obviously causes a change in the heart rate so exercise obviously means that there's going to be more carbon dioxide and if you have more carbon dioxide, that's going to mean that the blood plasma is going to be more acidic, so it's going to have a lower pH. But the other thing that could also lower the pH or increase the acidity of the blood plasma is obviously having more lactate through anaerobic respiration. And when that happens, it has to be detected. So you could actually detect the change in the pH, and that could be detected using chemoreceptors. And these chemoreceptors are located in the carotid body or the aortic body. And these chemoreceptors can then transmit electrical impulse to the cardiac control center in the medulla oblongata. Is the medulla oblongata clearly has the um, opportunity to then transmit electrical impulses to the SAN to change the heart rate. 
So when it does that, in this case, because you've had an exercise happening and you've got an increase in cardiac carbon dioxide produced, you want to increase the heart rate. So the sympathetic nervous or the sympathetic autonomic nervous system can therefore be stimulated and that could transmit an electrical impulse to the SAN. And when it transmits to the SAN, noradrenaline is then released at the SAN and that causes more electrical impulses or depolarization or a wave of electrical excitation across the atria. So that means that the atria contracts more rapidly and therefore the heart rate would therefore increase. Now when you stop exercising, because the heart rate has increased, therefore there is a higher blood pressure and that higher blood pressure or any changes in blood pressure is detected by carotid baroreceptors. So these are receptors that detect a change in blood pressure and they're only located in the carotid bodies, not in the aortic bodies of the aorta. And they could also transmit electrical impulses to the cardiac control center, the middle omelangata, which then this time, because there's an increase in blood pressure, will transmit electrical impulses through the parasympathetic nervous system to inhibit SAN. And instead of noradrenaline being released, they release acetylcholine, which would therefore decrease the heart rate and decrease the blood pressure. So the heart rate returns back to normal or the resting heart rate when exercise stops. Explain why heart rate changes at a time of a test. When you've got a test, obviously you might feel anxious. So in this case, you would release a hormone called adrenaline. So stress or fear causes the adrenal glands to release adrenaline into the bloodstream. So one effect we know of adrenaline is to increase the heart rate. So how does it does that? So if it's being secreted from the adrenal glands and goes to the bloodstream and travels all the way to the cardiac control center, the melamangata, this can therefore cause uh, impulses along the sympathetic nerve um, from the cardiac control center in the melamangata to then use uh, to release noradrenaline and when they release not adrenaline the SAN, obviously there's going to be more electrical impulses in the atria and the atria will then contract more and the heart rate will increase. So adrenaline can have an effect on the cardiac control center of the melamangata. It could also then affect the SAN where noradrenaline is released. It could also mimic the effect of noradrenaline by causing a more increase in the excitation of the atria. So there is an increase in heart rate. In GCSE, we learned about the relationship between the cardiac output, the stroke volume, and the heart rate. And if you look at the cardiac output, the cardiac output is the total volume of blood that leaves the left ventricle every minute. And that is clearly a volume per minute, so decimeter cubed per minute. And that equals the amount of blood or the volume of blood that leaves the left ventricle each heartbeat times how many times the heart beats. So here is the volume or this is the stroke volume of the left ventricle, how much volume of blood leaves the left ventricle and moves into the aorta. And if that moves into the aorta, say 60 times every minute, you would just multiply that volume. So the stroke volume multiplied the heart rate. So if it was 60 uh, beats per minute, will therefore equal the total volume of blood that leaves the left ventricle every minute. Explain how electrical events during cardiac cycle can lead to an increased stroke volume, so an increase in the volume of blood that leaves the left ventricle every heartbeat. So effectively, you're going to have more ventricles contracting. Is if you have an increase in stroke volume, that means that there's going to be stronger contraction of the ventricles. So people who exercise might have more contraction of the ventricles. So when they have that, there's going to be more impulses from the SAN to the AVN to the bundle of his and the Perkin fibers. And because of that, the ventricles could either contract more or alternatively, the contraction could be stronger. So one or the other. So both of these cause more blood to leave the left ventricle in each heartbeat. You could have more ventricle contractions, or you could have a stronger contraction of the ventricles, and that leads to an increase in the stroke volume.
Explain why Olympic athletes who train for long distance events often have a low resting heart rate. So because they have trained for longer, for long distances, that means they're going to have more heart muscles, they're going to have a thicker ventricle walls. And because they have thicker ventricle walls, therefore their stroke volume should increase because they can have a stronger contraction of vent ventricles. If they have more heart muscle cells there, then clearly their contraction will be a lot more stronger. So if there's a stronger contraction, that will increase the stroke volume. And if you increase the uh, stroke volume, because the cardiac output stays the same, that means the heart rate can be decreased. So there's going to be fewer heartbeats, and that fewer heartbeats can still supply sufficient oxygen and glucose to respiring cells, such as the muscle cells. Explain why there are no receptors monitoring carbon dioxide in pulmonary blood vessels. The pulmonary vessels carry or transport oxygen to and from the lungs to remove carbon dioxide. And obviously that means that there's no need for carbon dioxide to be controlled in the pulmonary vessels. We just need to know how much carbon dioxide they are in their uh, aortic bodies, as we mentioned earlier. Which part of the brain controls the level of carbon dioxide in the blood? So this is the part that clearly you transmit the chemical messages to. So this is the medulla oblongata, as we learned in the previous slide. So going back to this equation, obviously we've got the heart rate is beats per minute. So if someone had a heart rate of 60 beats per minute, and then they had a stroke volume, which is the volume of blood that leaves the left ventricle of 0 0.06 decimeter cubed per beat. That means their cardiac output, the total volume of blood that leaves the left ventricle, clearly is going to be the stroke volume multiplied by how many times the heart beats. So it'd be 0 0.06 volume of blood decimeter cubed per beat, you multiply by that by 60 beats per minute, and then you'll have a total volume of 3.6 decimeter cubed per minute. And if we go back to our question that we answered earlier, explain why Olympic athletes who train for long distance events often have a low resting heart rate. If they had a heart rate of 70 beats per minute before they started exercising, so this is before they did any sort of training and their stroke volume was 0 0.09, they'd have a cardiac output of six decimeter cubed per minute. However, if they then started exercising, because they now have more heart muscles, their ventricle walls are gonna be much thicker. That means they could have a stronger contraction. And because they could have a stronger contraction, their stroke volume should now increase. So you can see it's increased from 0 0.09 now to 0 0.15. So there's an increase in stroke volume. Now the cardiac output will still stay the same, but because it stays the same and the stroke volume has increased, that means the heart rate can therefore decrease. So therefore you could have the same cardiac output with fewer beats. In other words, the resting heart rate now decreases. And this is still sufficient to supply the oxygen and glucose to the respiring cells, as I mentioned earlier. So someone who trains, clearly having a higher stroke volume due to more or uh, heart muscle cells or thicker ventricle walls means that there could be stronger contraction, but therefore the heart doesn't have to beat as much to reach the same cardiac output. In GCC, we learned about the endocrine system, and obviously we know that um, this is where blood is filtered to remove urea, and we've got blood that enters the kidney, which is known as the renal artery, and then the blood that has already been filtered that leaves the kidney is the renal vein, and the renal vein has already got the urea removed, and the excess solutes and water are also removed, and then the urea that is produced in the kidney. Uh, travels through the ureter that carries the urine to from the kidney to the bladder and the bladder obviously stores it and then it's removed through the urethra. Describe the gross and microscopic structures of the mammalian kidney. So here's the structures of the kidney. In terms of the gross structures we obviously know about the renal artery and renal vein as I mentioned and also the ureter which carries the urine to the bladder. That urine arrives at the ureter through the pelvis, where urine uh, comes from the collecting duct. 
And if we look at the kidney, we've got uh, different parts. So we've got the cortex, which is the outside part, and then the inner part is known as the medulla. And within the cortex and medulla, you've got lots and lots of nephrons. So these are the structures of the nephrons we learned from TCC. So we've got the glomerulus, and the glomerulus is just the renal capillaries, and that's where blood is filtered, and the filtrate then enters the Bowman's capsule, and this is known as ultrafiltration, and that produces the glomerular filtrate. So just like when you filter something, you produce filtrates, this is known as the glomerular filtrate, because in the glomerulus, which is the renal capillaries, the blood is filtered into the Bowman's capsule to produce that glomerular filtrate. That uh, glomerular filtrate then travels through the proximal convoluted tubule, where you have selective reabsorption of things like glucose, salts, and amino acids, and they get transported back into the bloodstream. We don't want to lose those stuff, so if you filtered it from the blood, we want them to um, go back into the bloodstream. Then we've got osmoregulation, which is maintaining the concentration of water in the blood plasma. And that occurs through salt gradients in the loop of Henle and also through the secretion of ADH hormone um, that affects the collecting duct. And this also involves the basal recta in the loop of Henle where there's a counter current exchange system occurring. So here's the nephron structure. This would be similar to what we learned in GCC, but in more detail in A-level. So we know that ultrafiltration that happens in the glomerulus and the Bowman's capsule. That glomerular filter then goes through the proximal convoluted tubule where we've got selective reabsorption. We then have to control the amount of water in the blood through osmoregulation. And this happens both in the loop of Henle, where salt gradients are used, and then also additional parts in the collecting duct, which we learned through the effects of ADH secretion. Describe how urea is produced in mammals. So urea is actually produced from excess amino acids. And these excess amino acids are then uh, transported to the liver. And when they're transported to the liver, they are actually, uh, there is actually removal of the amino group from the amino acids. And that's known as deamination. And when you remove the amino group, you are left with ammonia and that ammonia then combines with carbon dioxide to produce the urea and that happens in something called the ornithine cycle which you don't need to know details of in the exam but you could then mention what the cycle is when it produces urea to get a mark. Explain how urea is removed from bloodstream. So first of all we're going to know what the cluster of blood capillaries or the renal capillaries that enclose the Bowman capsule is known as, and obviously we mentioned it earlier, these are the glomerulus, and that's where the blood is filtered. And if we then looked in more detail to the Bowman's capsule, we could see we've got some specialized cells called podocytes there. And these podocytes have microvillies that increase the surface area to volume ratio, and that means that obviously you can increase the amount of uh, filtration that occurs. Name process by which filtrate is produced in Bowman's capsule, as we mentioned earlier, this is known as ultrafiltration. And then explain the difference between the blood plasma in the renal artery and the filtrate in the Bowman's capsule. So in other words, when the blood gets filtered, what's the difference bet between the blood plasma before it's filtered and after it's filtered? So the difference between the blood in the renal artery and the renal vein. And obviously we could see um, if we talk about the blood in the plasma, we can see that the water concentration is roughly the same because water then reabsorbed back into the bloodstream. The amount of protein in the blood plasma is higher because those proteins clearly can't filter through. And you don't necessarily see any other changes in organic ions and glucose and amino acids and urea. So those stay the same between the blood plasma and the filtrate. So that means that the glucose, amino acids, urea, and inorganic ions then get filtered from the blood plasma into the filtrate if the concentrations are the same. So why is the protein concentration different? Why is there proteins in the blood plasma but not in the glomerular filtrate? That means that the proteins must be too big to pass through. So in other words, 
they're not in the glomerular filter of the Bowman's capsule. They haven't been filtered. They're too big to filter through. However, the concentration of glucose, ions, urea, water, and amino acids is the same in the filter and the blood plasma. Is clearly they got filtered from the blood plasma and they're now they're part of the glomerular filtrate. And that's because they are small enough to pass through. So that's the first stage of the nephron. We can see in the Bowman's capsule, the blood plasma in the glomerulus, the capillaries, get filtered into the Bowman's capsule to produce the glomerular filtrate, and that is dependent on the size. So obviously proteins can't pass through, they stay in the blood. However, things like minerals, amino acids, urea, water, salts, they actually get filtered and now part of the glomerular filtrate. And then they move on to the proximal convoluted tubule where there is selective reabsorption. In selective reabsorption, things like sodium, amino acids, glucose are reabsorbed from the glomerular filtrate and they move back to the blood. And that's obviously they're still useful substances, so we don't want them to be part of the urine. So if you look at this diagram here, it shows a cell of the proximal convoluted tubule of the nephron. Explain how features shown in the diagram enables this cell to carry out its function. So if you think about it, the blood plasma still has a higher concentration than the glomerular filtrate. So we're trying to move these things back into the blood plasma against the concentration gradient. So to move it against the concentration gradient, that means you're going to have to use active transport. And for active transport, you're going to need lots of energy, lots of ATP. So therefore, you're going to need lots a cell that is uh, specialized or adapted by having lots of mitochondria and obviously to increase the rate of reabsorption you want to increase the surface area to volume ratio and that involves having microvilli. So there are large numbers of mitochondria to provide ATP for active transport of glucose, salts, amino acids, minerals such as sodium and the microvilli provide a large surface area to volume ratio for so that there could be obviously lots of carrier proteins for the glucose, salts, amino acids to be actively transported back. After the proximal convoluted tubule, the glomerular filtrate then moves on to the next stage. So explain why glucose concentration in the bladder is very low. So we know it's very low because the glucose has been selectively reabsorbed in the proximal convoluted tubule. So that means glucose is selectively reabsorbed by active transport against the concentration gradient. So therefore, there shouldn't really be a lot of glucose in the blood the vast majority of it should have been selectively reabsorbed and gone back into the bloodstream. That leaves mainly urea, but there's also water, and obviously we want to retain the water, so that water needs to also be reabsorbed back into the bloodstream. To explain how water is reabsorbed, and this occurs mainly in the loop of Henle. So most of the water is actually reabsorbed in the loop of Henle, and this amount of water tends to be fixed. So if you want to find control the amount of water that is reabsorbed, that then happens later on in the collecting duct, which is what we learned in GCSC. The vast majority of water is actually reabsorbed in the loop of Henley, and that amount of water tends to be the same. So it tends to be fixed, but then you can make slight changes to the collecting duct to then actually increase the amount of water reabsorption or decrease, it, decrease the amount based on how much water there is in the bloodstream. So this is known as the descending loop, and this is the ascending loop of Henle. And what happens in the ascending loop of Henle is we've got chloride and sodium ions, and they are actually actively transported out of the ascending loop of Henle. And when that happens, obviously you've now got a high solute concentration in the medulla. So because there's a high solute concentration there, that means there'll be a lower water potential. So this results in a sodium chloride concentration or a lower water potential in the medulla. The ascending limb is impermeable. So it's actually impermeable to water. So obviously if there's a lower water potential in the medulla, the water won't move from a higher water potential in the ascending limb to a lower water potential in the medulla because that ascending limb is impermeable. However, water can be reabsorbed from the descending loop or the descending loop of Henle by obviously osmosis, and that's because that descending limb is permeable. 
Now, what effect does that have on the concentration of sodium ions in the descending loop and the ascending loop of Henle? Obviously, if you are removing water out of the descending loop of Henle, therefore the concentration of the sodium ions in the descending loop of Henle will therefore increase. However, in the ascending loop of Henle, we are actively transporting the sodium ions out. So in this case, you are removing sodium ions. So the concentration of sodium ions in the ascending loop of Henle should actually decrease. And then this creates a salt gradient, which is really important in terms of water being moved out of the descending loop of Henle by osmosis. So that loop of Henle acts as what is known as a countercurrent multiplier. The loop of Henle acts as a countercurrent multiplier because the flow of the filtrate in both limbs, so in the descending and the ascending limb, are clearly in opposite directions, but they are also in the opposite direction to the blood flow. And because they're in the opposite direction to the blood flow, therefore you create what is known as a salt gradient, and that salt gradient has an effect on how much water is removed out of the descending limb because the descending limb is in, is permeable and therefore water can be removed by osmosis and moved into the bloodstream so it's reabsorbed back into the bloodstream now where the nephron contains a longer loop of henle so a longer descending loop or descending limb therefore you're going to have a more of a salt gradient so therefore it's going to be a greater effect on the concentration of the filtrate so therefore, more water can be reabsorbed back into the bloodstream. And organisms that want to have a longer loop of Henle are clearly those that need that adaptation if they live in hot, arid desert conditions. An example of that is a desert rat. And these desert rats tend to have more of these chapter medulla nephrons. These are the nephrons which have longer loops of Henle in comparison to the cortical nephrons. So organisms have both types of nephrons, but they have more of the longer version. So desert mammals have long loops of Henle. That allows for greater countercurrent multiplier effect. Therefore, higher concentration of salute or sodium ions in the kidney medulla. We know that it's going to be a higher concentration because obviously you could actively pump out more sodium ions in the ascending loop of Henle. Because the long loops also have a greater surface area, so it's going to be a greater salt gradient, and it's going to be a very low water potential in the kidney medulla, because every time the water moves out, it goes back into the bloodstream, so therefore the water is not having an effect on the salt concentration in the medulla. However, when the salt ions are actually pumped out, they help to maintain the salt gradients. So having a long loop of Henle means that you have a greater salt gradient. So more water is reabsorbed by osmosis from the descending limb. So this is one adaptation that um, desert rats have. So explain how kidney of kangaroo rat is adapted for life in dry environments is because they have longer loops of Henle. In topic four, we mentioned the importance of water in terms of what effects it has in, in animal cells. So obviously, if there's too much water that moves into animal cells by osmosis, it could lice. If there's too little, the animal cells can shrivel. I mentioned this at the beginning of this topic as well. So obviously, it's important to maintain a homeostatic level of water concentration in blood plasma. And this is controlled by osmoregulation. So we know water moves out in the loop of Henle, but then there are additional water that can be moved out in the collecting duct, and this we learnt in GCC has got to do with the secretion of a hormone called ADH. So if there's a normal blood concentration, that's got to do with how much water there is in the blood plasma. But after drinking water, we know that that blood concentration will then become dilute. There's a higher water potential or is hypertonic. And then this is detected by receptors. So in this case, these will be called osmoreceptors and these are in the hypothalamus and when they detect the blood concentrations become dilute 
what they do is they secrete less ADH. So less ADH is released by the pituitary gland and therefore the collecting duct become less permeable. And when they become less permeable, less water is reabsorbed by osmosis back into the bloodstream. And this means that there's going to be more of water in the urine. So you have a larger volume of water in the urine. So therefore that urine will be dilute. And therefore there's going to be less water in the bloodstream. So you're returning the water concentration in the bloodstream back to the normal homeostatic level, which means that the blood concentration returns back to normal. And then the opposite happens when you're dehydrated or you've ingested salt or you're sweating, obviously you're losing water in this case. So therefore the blood concentration becomes concentrated. So there is a lower water potential or is hypertonic. And then because of that, this is again detected by osmoreceptors in the hypothalamus. So more ADH is secreted by the pituitary gland. The collecting duct becomes more permeable. More water is reabsorbed by osmosis back into the bloodstream. So therefore there's going to be less water in the urine. So there's going to be a smaller volume. And that means that urine will be more concentrated. So a smaller volume of concentrated urine is produced. And because the water, more water is being reabsorbed back into the bloodstream, the blood concentration in the bloodstream therefore returns back to a normal homeostatic level. So you can see a difference in the diagrams here when a large volume of dilute urine is produced or when a small volume of concentrated urine is produced. In the small volume of concentrated urine that is produced is because more water is reabsorbed back into the bloodstream by osmosis so therefore you're going to have less water in the urine and this is because the collecting duct have become more permeable because more adh has been secreted by the pituitary gland and this is because the osmo receptors has detected there's less water in the blood plasma so therefore the hypothalamus stimulates the pituitary gland or actually inhibits it from secreting ADH so therefore less ADH is secreted. And then that is the function of the whole nephron. So we learnt about autofiltration happens in the Bowman's capsule where you produce the glomer filtrate and that's got to do with how small the molecules are. In the proximal convoluted tubal we've got selective reabsorption with active transport involved. The loop of Henley, we've got osmoregulation due to salt gradients that are created due to the change in sodium ion um, concentrations. And then also we've got the collecting duct where you've got fine tuning of osmoregulation. So depending on how much water there is in the bloodstream, therefore you have an effect through detection through osmoregulators, uh, which then they are in the hypothalamus, which then either stimulate or inhibit the pituitary gland, and then the ADH secretion obviously affects the permeability of the collecting duct. And then that has an overall effect on the concentration of the urea produced. So that was osmoregulation. Now, what is the core body temperature of humans? So they're moving on to thermoregulation. So in humans, the core body temperature is 37 degrees Celsius. Now we know the importance of temperature because the optimum temperature is where you have the highest enzyme activity or the highest rate of reactions in our body. So it's really important to maintain the core body temperature. So obviously this happens through homeostasis and a negative feedback mechanism. Explain how endotherms and ectotherms control their body temperature. So this will be different between both. So ectotherms, they rely on external environment. So they warm up using external sources, such as the heat radiated from the sun. Therefore, their body temperatures can clearly fluctuate. They tend to have low energy demands, so they don't actually have high metabolic rates. They don't have low metabolic rates because they can't rely on their own body maintaining their core body temperature. Therefore, they live in a limited range of environments. They have to have behavioral control of their temperature and examples of ectotherms are things like fish, reptiles, amphibia and invertebrates whereas endotherms tend to be things like birds and mammals and here body heat is generated through metabolism because they are exothermic 
we maintain a cool body temperature within a narrow range using homeostasis and negative feedback mechanisms. We have high energy demands because obviously controlling our cool body temperature means that we can actually have high metabolic rates. Therefore, we can cope with extreme conditions and we use a combination of behavioral and physiological temperature controls. So in endotherms, that is birds and mammals, we produce heat through metabolic processes such as respiration, which are exothermic reactions, and that warms up the body. And obviously we could then control using behavioral and physiological methods, the core body temperature. Comment on how rate of respiration for mice would differ from wood lice. So mice we know are endotherms, whereas wood lice would be exotherms. So the mouse rate of respiration would actually be greater than wood lice. As we mentioned, mice are endotherms, so they have a higher metabolic rate. So they need to maintain the body temperature because they'll have more heat loss. So how do humans regulate temperature through behavior? The things that humans can do, well clearly we have behavioral changes that we do where we actually modify the environment. So we could build houses, have shelters, we could light fires and wear clothes. So these are behavioral modifications that we could have when it is cold, but then when it's hot, we could install and use air conditioning or build and use swimming pools when the temperature is too hot. However, other endotherms can't modify the environment. So how do they regulate the temperature through behavioral uh, methods? So they could do things like sun basking, which is like sunbathing. They could also shelter from direct warmth of the sun, or they could increase the amount of evaporation, which therefore loses energy to the environment. That could happen through panting or through licking the skin. And then the other thing they could do is also hibernate and that reduces or slows down the metabolic rate. So those are behavioral changes that endotherms can do to regulate temperature. In GCSE, we learned how temperature is monitored and detected. So we know that it is uh, both monitored and detected through the hypothalamus. And that could also receive, so there are temperature receptors, not only in the hypothalamus that detects the temperature change in the blood plasma, but there are also receptors in the skin. So these receptors in the dermal part of the skin can detect whether it is too hot or too cold in the external environment, but internally, we can also detect changes in the temperature of the blood through the hypothalamus. So when it's too hot, obviously we have redder face, and the reason we have face that is more red because more blood is going closer to the surface of our skin. So having that increased blood flow closer to the skin surface means that more heat energy can be radiated out to the environment and that will cool the body because you're losing that heat energy through radiation. Obviously, when we're very cold, that blood is less likely to be close to the skin. Explain how endotherms regulate temperature physiologically. So again, you should learn this from GCSE. You can see these are blood vessels where more blood flows close to the skin surface when it's hot, but less blood flows close to the skin surface when it's cold. So they're clearly known as vasodilation and vasoconstriction. And then there are other mechanisms such as sweating to increase heat loss through evaporation. And then we also got changes to our hair as well. And that act, can act as an insulation when it's trapping air. So here's another example of negative feedback. And we've got a core body temperature of 37 degrees Celsius. And if there's an increase in core body temperature, so it's too hot, that is detected by thermal receptors in the skin and hypothalamus, as mentioned earlier. And then nerve impulses are transmitted through the autonomic nervous system, and they can be transmitted to, obviously, capillaries next to the skin surface. These dermal arterioles or blood vessels can dilate and widen, known as vasodilation, 
and therefore more blood can flow close to the skin surface. They can also be transmitted to sweat glands, which will secrete more sweat over the skin epidermis. And when that evaporates, it loses heat energy from the body. So increasing that heat energy lost in the environment through either radiation or through evaporation or even conduction means that the core body temperature should return back to normal homeostatic level of 37 degrees Celsius. You then also got the opposite that can happen. So if there's a decrease in cold body temperature, it's too cold. Again, detected by thermal receptors in the skin and hypothalamus, you could then transmit nerve impulses through the ultimate nervous system to these dermal arterioles. And in this case, what you do is these blood vessels will constrict and narrow, known as vasoconstriction. So less blood will flow close to the skin surface. So less heat energy is going to be lost to the environment through radiation. And then the other thing you could do is use erector muscles on the skin dermis can contract. And when they contract, that causes the body hairs to stand up, upright, and this traps air, which acts as an insulator. So when it acts as an insulator, therefore you're decreasing the amount of heat energy lost to the environment through radiation. So in both phase of constriction and the contraction of erector muscles causes less heat energy to be lost to the environment and therefore the, hopefully the core body temperature can return back to normal homeostatic level of 37 degrees Celsius. There are other physiological methods that other endotherms can use and this involves countercurrent exchange systems. So an example on the left, how do ducks walk on ice without their cold body temperature decreasing between below a critical level, so before having hypothermia? That's because the blood that flows to the legs radiates out heat to the blood that returns back to the body. So therefore, cold blood doesn't return back to the body. It's actually gaining heat energy from the blood that is transported down towards the legs and therefore it warms up and then that warm blood goes back to the body and protects it. And then you've got the opposite effect in organisms that live in hot environments. So examples would be things like camels and oryx. In those circumstances, they're worried about their brain overheating. So you want cooler blood reaching the brain, but then when that blood returns back to the body, you want to warm it up. So in this case, the blood that is returning back to the body is more into the center. So it is surrounded by warm blood that is on either side and that radiates out heat to the blood returning back to the body to keep warmer uh, blood returning back to the body, just like the example of the duck. However, that cooler uh, blood actually goes to the brain first. And when it goes to the brain first, that means that it doesn't overheat the brain. So again, you've got an example of a countercurrent exchange system happening where you've got blood that is traveling in opposite direction when it's traveling either to the legs and returning back to the body or traveling to the brain and returning back to the body they're in opposite directions and that's known as a countercurrent exchange system and that is the whole of topic 9 control systems